During this presentation, we will be going over the operation and detailed description of our solar-powered UV water purifying and monitoring system. It was designed and presented by Kendra Kordak, Bradley Blackburn, Lucas Heredia, and Grant Cooper. The sponsors for this project were Ocean Insight, which lended us our Raman spectrometer and laser module. MKS Network provided us with optical equipment in order to implement our spectroscopy system, and DCI Technologies supplied us with some electrical equipment for implementation and testing, as well as a place to work on the project. Some motivation behind this project would be to help stop widespread viruses. As we all know, COVID-19 has been going around, and although it is not a water-based virus, it is still a good example on why we should work toward stopping these spreads. Also, filtration quality. By adding in water analysis into our system, it helps keep give the user uh, more peace of mind about their filtration system. And then also the fact that this project was sponsored, therefore it took a lot of financial burden off of the group. There are a couple similar products out in the market as of now. One would be the Brita filter. Um, most filters like this only incorporate one filter. They don't have inline water monitoring and there are no UV treatment to the water. Um, also, there's the crazy cap, but this only incorporates UV treatment. There's no other sediment filters or carbon filters, and it also does not include water monitoring. For a general overview of the system, we provided a CAD drawing over here on the left. This was our original thought where we would go with a dolly design to keep the system mobile as well as semi-portable. On the right, we have a picture of the actual design. At the top, we have our electrical panel as well as the LCD screen. In the middle, this is our filtration panel. As you can see, there's the pump, the filtration system, and then the spectrometer equipment. And then at the bottom, we have the battery. The solar panels are located off to the left, and we couldn't quite fit those on the dolly, therefore they will stay off of the system. This system block diagram depicts the operation of the system. At the beginning, the solar panels will be co collecting energy. The charge controller will take this energy and charge the battery. The batteries will provide power to the PCB power supplies, and these power supplies will be connected to the components via a relay control system. The control system will be controlled by the Raspberry Pi and the user interface. The water will enter the system, be filtered, and it will be analyzed by the temperature sensor and the spectrometer. The spectrometer receives the laser data and it creates a frequency response that will be displayed on a user's computer. The temperature sensor will provide feedback into the Raspberry Pi and the goal is to display it the temperature of the water on the user interface. This chart is showing the workload distribution. Brad will be taking care of the solar power system, the charge controller, and the control relay system. Brent will be taking care of the PCB power supplies, the filtration system, and the water pump. Lucas will be dealing with the user interface and the Raspberry Pi setup. And Kendra will be dealing with the spectroscopy, the UV filtration, and deciding which IR temperature sensor we'll be using. We have three main objectives and goals that we would like to demonstrate in this project, which would be inline contaminant and temperature monitoring, complete off-grid operation, and a successful interactive user interface. This chart shows the specifications for each subsystem in the project. The first three are highlighted because these are our main focus in the project, where we will be trying to create an off-grid operating system, successfully analyzing water through Raman spectroscopy, and creating a user interface that not only controls the system, but also displays some feedback. We also have some important data on the charge controller, the filtration system, the Raspberry Pi, and the control relay system. The solar power system will include two 100 watt polycrystalline solar panels, one 12 volt 20 amp charge controller, and one 12 volt 75 amp power battery. The polycrystalline solar panels were a good option because they were relatively cheaper than the other options. They have dimensions of 36 by 36 by 1 inch, and they weigh roughly 13 to 14 pounds. The charge controller was gotten from circuits.com with the model of SCC3. This was incorporated into the system when the last charge controller was deemed too simple, and this one offered a little more electrical um, savvy, if you rather, into the system. And the battery is a universal power group battery with a model number of UV12750. It should provide plenty of power to operate the system for about six to eight hours. For the three components in the solar system, there were some alternative components considered, 
before, for example, the solar cell technology, there were monocrystalline solar panels. These are solar panels that are made of one type of silicon, or rather a very pure form of silicon, which gives them a very high efficiency. But the downside to these is that they have a very high price. Also, there were thin film solar panels. These thin film solar panels are very thin. They're actually flexible, which enables them to be very space efficient. And their price isn't too high, but it was still higher than our polycrystalline solar panels. For the charge controllers, there are series and shunt charge controllers. A shunt charge controller short circuits the solar panel in order to stop charging of the battery. And a series charge controller uh, cuts, cuts the current off or in, interrupts the current from the solar panel to the battery. These are very low priced, but they're quite simple, and we didn't think it would be a good fit for our system. Also, there's an MPPT charge controller. This is this is a maximum power point tracking charge controller. These are very high efficiency, and they are mainly used in commercial applications where efficiency is very important, and these are very expensive. For batteries, we could have gone with a lithium ion battery, which has a very large depth, depth of discharge, but these batteries require substantial protection circuitry around them, and they are also quite highly priced. And the most expensive battery would be an AGM lead acid battery. They are lightweight, where normal batteries are very heavy, and they have a low internal resistance, which enables them to be charged very quickly. Um, our sealed lead acid battery was also a sponsored component by DCI Technologies, which is why we chose that as well. So some might ask why we would need a control relay system, and it is mainly because the Raspberry Pi was not built to handle large external loads. It also would not be able to produce the correct 12 volt signal to flip any of these relays. So first, the 3.3 volt signal from the Raspberry Pi outputs would need to be stepped up to 12 volts in order to flip a relay. So the Opto 22 board acts as a switch in order to take 12 volts in, and then when it receives a signal from the Raspberry Pi, it will close each one of these output modules which will connect 12 volts to the relay, in turn turning the relay on. The relay also acts like a switch in where when it receives this 12 volt signal from the Opto 22 board, it will connect one side of the relay to the other. On one side of the relay, which is the left side specifically, is the power supply PCB side. And on the other side, these white wires go to each of their respective components. So when this relay is turned on by the Opto 22 module from the user interface, it connects their power supply PCB board to its respective component in the system. So before we could choose our filtration system, we needed to learn about all the different filtration technologies. I'm not going to go into too much depth on this because this is a long presentation and we want to focus on the electrical, but I will say uh, it came down to kind of chemical disinfectant or UV water sanitation. And we decided to go with the UV because it was the best at killing um, all types of pathogens, whether it be uh, bacteria, viruses, protozoan cysts, or parasites. Um, there were cases where the chemical disinfectants could not kill the parasites or protozoan, and it led to um, like 200 deaths here in the United States. So we really wanted to, especially with COVID, focus on getting rid of those pathogens. Um, and so the, the con of the UV water sanitizer is that it requires a pre-filter. Pre-filter to take out the sediment, to take out all, all those little grains, because um, bacteria or other pathogens can hide behind that and um, avoid the UV rays. So we really want to take those out so that the germs will be exposed. Displayed is our final filtration system. It consists of a sediment filter, a carbon block filter, and a UV chamber. It actually came as one unit, which was really useful so that we could focus less on plumbing and more on electrical engineering. Uh, it has a 3.5 gallons per minute flow rate. So we want to make sure that our pump rate is uh, less than that, and also it's powered by 12 volts DC. So again, before we chose our pump, we wanted to look at all the available technologies to make sure we were making the best decision. Uh, it really came down to um, which pumps were able to be self-priming, which means that it can run uh, without water inside of it, and because we wanted to be able to you know, suck up water from a leak or any source like that. And so the diaphragm pump does exactly that, and that was the main uh, reason we chose to go with that styling. So this is the pump we decided to use for our project. Um, the most important aspects of it are that it operates at 12 volts DC. It's actually a water pump created to be used on a boat or an RV, so that's why it has that um, voltage input. 
Also, we want to look at the flow rate that it pumps water at a rate of 2.9 gallons per minute, and that is lower than our UV gallons per minute, which can handle 3.5. So we're actually giving um, our system a little more time to have even more exposure to really make sure that we eliminate any pathogens. Displayed currently is the hardware of our project coming from the charge controller. It's going to go to uh, three separate voltage regulators, and those voltages will be sent to the loads, but they'll be um, controlled by the relays. The Raspberry Pi GPIO pins will either go high or low, depending on our button presses, and that will turn on and off our loads. The crucial part in our design was creating the PCBs for the voltage regulators. Uh, we have a 5-volt, a 24-volt, and a 12-volt regulator. Uh, we decided to use separate PCBs um, for each regulator. This was so that we could have the regulators directly at the source so that there would be no voltage drop over the wires, taking them from the PCB to the components. Uh, our laser is a very sensitive component, so we don't want to deal with the voltage drop in the wires. Also, our 12 volt specifically is handling a very high amperage up to 12 amps. It could be passing through that PCB and that's going to be generating a lot of noise, so we really wanted to separate our regulators from uh, that 12 amp so that it didn't disturb uh, the processes on the other regulators. We decided to go with 0805 parts uh, due to COVID and uncertainty of how we're going to get our design soldered, so we wanted to have parts big enough that we could solder ourselves. Um, a trend that you could notice in PCB design is that as the max current increases, the complexity is going to increase as well. Um, with higher amperage, you're going to have to make much more thermal considerations, uh, trace considerations, and laying out the ground is going to take a lot more effort than in uh, lower current uh, applications. So the reality of Webbench Power Supply Designer, uh, they say on their website, you know, spend 30 minutes with us and you'll have your completed PCB ready to go. That's not really the case. Um, when trying to... Uh, upload library files from Webbench to uh, Eagle. There are errors in the parts for all three of our regulators, so it's really recommended that uh, Webbench be used as a schematic generator. So we used Webbench to get our schematic, and then we took that and used it in Easy EDA, and we were able to create the three voltage regulators you'll see soon. So to reiterate, all of our ICs and the layouts were chosen from Webbench Power Supply Designer. Uh, schematic and PCBs were designed using Easy EDA and then taken to QMS Quality Manufacturing Services to solder. Um, some unique parts of our 5-volt regulator. It's a 2-layer board with 2-ounce copper. We chose 2-ounce copper over 1-ounce because uh, more copper means better thermal regulation and with our high amperage, that's required. Um, if you look closely, V in and V out are not traces, but uh, planes instead. That's also to deal with the larger current. Thermal vias are placed underneath the IC to move he heat from that top layer to the second layer of the board for better thermal regulation. And if you, you can also see that there's a large ground plane for thermal regulation plus noise reduction. This is a 24 volt regulator. We decided to use uh, one ounce copper on this board since it had such low amperage. Uh, it was kind of unnecessary to go with the two ounce. Um, so some real world engineering problem solving was that we took this board to QMS to solder it and they actually placed our diode on backwards and told me that the regulator wasn't working. And then, so fearing that that board could have been corrupted from them running it backwards, um, I brought on another board and they put the diode on backwards again. So um, it's pretty crazy that that happened, but I guess that's just part of the real world engineering and you need to be double checking even PCBs that you give to uh, reputable com companies. So displayed is the final PCB we created, the 12 volt regulator. I like to call this guy the big enchilada because of how complex of a design it was. It has 48 components on it. Um, so a key factor in, in this design was the use of separate ground planes, an analog ground plane and a, a power ground plane. And though I say separate, they are connected, but at specific spots on the PCB um, where it's not going to cause any like excess noise. We chose to include UV cleaning in our system because filtration doesn't always eliminate all the viruses and bacteria in water. The wavelength for UV sanitation is from about 100 nanometers to 280 nanometers and is called UVC. 
Both LEDs and lamps produce this wavelength and can be used for UV sanitation. We thought a UV lamp would be the most efficient for this project because we would only have to purchase one versus multiple LEDs, and making sure the LEDs covered every centimeter of the water with equal power is much more difficult than a lamp covering. To ensure the UV sanitation is effective, there are time requirements the UV radiation has to hit the water. Extremely harmful bacteria, like E. coli, needs to be UV sanitized for at least 0.3 seconds. As you can see, most of the requirements are under one second. So to make sure we cover all the bacteria and virus time requirements, we made sure the UV sanitizes our water for at least one second. To monitor the temperature, we chose an infrared temperature sensor. This temperature sensor reads the amount of infrared light an object is giving off. It is contactless and gives a fast readout. It also has a 2 to 1 ratio and would be best placed 100 to 200 milliliters away from the glass tube the water is being analyzed through. Raman spectroscopy for water analysis was chosen for multiple reasons. The first being it can be built into the system and provide inline real-time monitoring. Another being because water is a weak Raman scatter, so the contaminants will cause more scatter than the water. We chose near-infrared Raman to avoid fluorescent noise if the water is contaminated with any biological substances. Raman spectroscopy works by shunning a light source into a sample and measuring how much energy the photons shift by, colliding with certain molecules. Stokes Raman spectroscopy measures how much energy is lost, and anti-Stokes measures how much energy is gained. Stokes Raman spectroscopy is simpler and occurs at lower energy, so it is better used with near-infrared. Raman spectroscopy can be very expensive and wouldn't be possible in our project without ocean insight. Chromatography and inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy are two other ways of analyzing water. Both of these approaches require an expert and a lot of equipment. You can typically only test one sample and cannot build these into a portable system. This is the Raman spectrometer loaned to us by Ocean Insights. It is one of their first modules built and tested for this application. It can perform Raman spectroscopy at both 532 nanometers and 785 nanometers. It is powered through a computer using a USB-C cable and is compatible with OceanView software. It is small and portable at only 3.5 by 2 by 2 inches. The laser module led by Ocean Insights is a 785 nanometer fiber coupled diode laser. This module is temperature stabilized with a heat sink. It has a 10 pin connector. We use the 5 volt pin and the ground pin, but the module can be wired in a way that you can adjust the power output using a pulse width modulator. Because we powered the laser using the 5 volts and just the ground, it should output about 499 milliwatts or 0.5 watts, causing it to be a class 3B laser. We use a single mode FC fiber from Thor Labs to connect to this laser. For the Raman spectroscopy, I built the following system. Connected to the laser module is a 2 meter FC fiber with 125 micron output. The collimator connected to the FC fiber is made for about 780 nanometers for single mode fibers with a beam diameter of 2.2 millimeters. After collimating the output laser light, we put it through a bandpass filter made for 780 to clean up the laser beam. After the bandpass filter is a 50 millimeter convex lens that will focus the light onto the water coming through the glass tube. When the light is passed through the tube and scattered, it will pass through a 50 millimeter concave lens that will collimate the scattered light. The scattered light will pass through a long pass filter. This long pass filter will eliminate light not at the desired wavelength. Finally, the scattered light will be sent through an aspheric lens with a focal length of 5.29 millimeters, which focuses the scattered light onto a 200 micron SMA fiber connected to the Raman spectroscopy. The components made for 780 nanometers have a plus minus error of more than 5 nanometers, and therefore we could use them for the system. The system would be more efficient with components tailored to 785 nanometers, but would have to, bit, would have to be specially made by Newport and out of the price range. In order to see if our water was being cleaned and analyzed, we chose different substances to put in water and test. The first was a chlorine tablet typically used for pools. The second was a highly toxic snake poison, which can even be toxic by smelling it. The last was laundry detergent, mainly because it contains benzene and we wanted to see if we could get the specific Roman shift of benzene. In order to ensure accurate readings, we filled glass tubes with the contaminant and water mixed together. These glass tubes are the same glass tube being used with the clean water output. This is what each contaminant test tube looks like. The glass tubes are made of borosilicate glass and polycarbonate. For the Raman spectroscopy analysis, we are using OceanView, which is Ocean Insights compatible software. OceanView has a Raman application we were able to use and modify for our specific system. For our Raman spectroscopy, I set the integration time to 40 milliseconds and the boxcar with the six. 
The shift range program with 785 nanometers is 552.78 to 1,084.42 centimeters to negative one. You are able to take a light and dark background spectrum to subtract the noise. This software also records the graph and the table data of intensity versus raw shift. This slide shows one spectrum we got from analyzing tap water. The results of Raman's spectroscopy are typically represented by a graph where the x-axis is frequency of light and the y-axis is intensity. The change in energy of light is the main interest. The Raman shift is the difference in frequency of the laser light and the scattered light. There are multiple ways of interpreting a Raman spectrum. One is by recognition of molecular functional groups. These groups appear at distinct Raman shifts. Another approach involves looking at the fingerprint region of specific spectrum. This is seen at frequencies below 1500 inverse centimeters and has substance specific patterns. Lastly, you can use an algorithm that interprets the shift. Since our system isn't sensitive enough to see the fingerprint shift, writing an algorithm to interpret our data is the best approach. For the spectroscopy system, we had a few constraints. The first being that we were not able to calculate the exact parts per billion of individual contaminants in our test tubes. Therefore, we couldn't compare parts per billion before and after cleaning. The second is our spectroscopy system wasn't sensitive enough to give shifts of specific chemicals like benzene, but we are able to take baseline spectrums of clean water and compare. The third constraint is oversaturation. The power coming out of the laser is a little too much for the spectrometer, and due to the spectrometer not having a data sheet, we aren't able to see the amount of power that oversaturates. To solve this, we ordered neutral density filters and lowered the integration time. The spectrometer will still sometimes oversaturate. Finally, our last constraint is the consistent movement of the clean water through the tube. This means the data needs to be consistently recorded for a while, and an algorithm needs to be written in order to process the amount of data. Hi. As far as the application side of the project, the original goal was to interface all the components to a single chip or a microcomputer. In this case, the microcomputer, the Raspberry Pi. But since we were not able to interface the spectrometer, that basically it's what detects the impurities of the water, is we decided to make the program application just a control system of all the components that are running. So the first idea was to use a microcontroller instead of a microcomputer because it's very cheap, and we'd be able to solder directly into the PCB. But the thing is that microcontrollers, they have very little RAM and very little processing power, so we had to upgrade to a actual computer to run all the applications. So we had to choose the hardware to run our applications. And what you're looking for is a small computer that was capable of running the software that is controlling the spectrometer, as well as they had a firmware the firmware to enable the screen. So we end up to choosing the Raspberry Pi Model 4D. That's the last model available. So why do you choose the Raspberry Pi? So the first thing is because it passed all the specs, it had enough processing power and enough memory. The other reason is that it has a, a standard display, a screen display that could be easily interfaced using a DSI cable. You didn't need to install any additional firmware. And the last reason is because it's a very popular, it's a very popular microcomputer, so it has a big community. So in case it, it ran into issues regarding to compatibility, there are always libraries and then you can download for it and software that are made just for compatibility. So this is the standard display of the Raspberry Pi, the screen display of the Raspberry Pi. So in the beginning, we had the option between you making the user interact with the application using a mechanical pad or using a touchscreen display, and we decided the touchscreen display. The display is very it's also very nice because it's the correct size, the buttons are the buttons are in the correct size, they're not too small or too big. And it also it doesn't it doesn't require any software in to interface the Raspberry very Pi. It's made it's it is automatic. So since we're using a computer to run the system, we must install OS in this computer. And we're trying to use Linux because it is free and it has no patent as opposed to Windows that is, it, ha, it is licensed under Microsoft. Another problem with Windows is that it is not compatible. The Raspberry Pi does not run the full desktop version of Windows, it runs a simplified version. So in the original project, our goal was to use OmniDrive. So OmniDrive is a library made by Ocean Insights, the company that we borrow the spectrometer. And it's, this company, this library, they developed it, but it, this library is licensed and they did not give us the permission to access it, so 
we, we were not, and we, the reason why we wanted this library is so we could develop the application from scratch and everything would be running just one application. For this provision to be not be possible. So it took us a while to discover what Ocean Insights was going to give us. In the beginning, we thought that Ocean Insights was going to give us the OmniDrive library. And OmniDrive is compatible with both Java and C Sharp. It is also compatible with other languages, but they don't make sense for the sake of developing this project. So between Java and C Sharp, I decided to begin coding Java because first, I am more familiar with Java, and the second reason is because OmniDrive is it was built using Java, so by using Java we could potentially not run into bugs. So in the end we end up scrapping Java as well, and everything is now being controlled by Python libraries. So let me talk a little bit about the UI, which is so. It, so the first UI I built was using. JavaFX because it's a more modern looking library. So in the left you can see the original GUI we developed using JavaFX, but because of the Java virtual machine compatibility with the GPIOs we were using to control the component, we, were, we had to scrap this GUI and build everything using Python, a Python GUI. So in the end everything is being controlled using a Python script. It is control this script is controlling all the signals in the system. Let me go over the final libraries that got implemented that uh, we use to control the system. So GUI zero is again equivalent to Java Swing is not very modern looking. An alternative to that is QT to make it a better GUI, a graphical user interface. But I did not have time to learn QT. And we I des we decided to focus on interfacing the spectrum and QDM. So Adafruit DAT is to use the interface as a computer sensor. It's made for the Raspberry Pi. And Raspberry GPIO, it sends the GPIO signals. And Wizard Lord is to, co is to coordinate the first, uh, the first temperature sensor. From the previous midterm demo, our progress has finished. We've had successfully implemented and presented our project, tested it, and integrated the entire system. Overall, the project came out quite nicely. Everything operated as expected. Our successes and our goals that we achieved were to successfully implement our UV filtration system, got the system solar powered and completely off-grid, and we successfully created a user interface that controls the system. We also were able to analyze the water to a certain extent, which is great. The difficulties we ran into, but did not hold us back necessarily, were first the temperature sensor. The Raspberry Pi is not an analog reading microcontroller, so the 4 to 20 milliamp signal was a little difficult to um, implement or read, but we were able to figure that out at the last minute, which was very nice. The one thing we were not able to do was display the spectrometer data on into our user interface. There were some library incompatibilities, as well as um, not being able to get access to OmniDriver in time in order for us to build our own program. But overall, the project went really well. The original proposed budget was about $1,000. Unfortunately, this was surpassed by about 80%. Um, part of the reason was this was buying different components to make things compatible, as well as um, the solar power system and the filtration system probably took up the most. But um, I would say compared to the amount spent, we had over $10,000 of equipment loaned to us. So realistically, the amount spent was not too bad. But in the end, we did go over budget.